Handmade clocks not only tell time, but they also tell a story. For most of my life, I've known very little about this clock, not even what it looked like. Story goes that my grandfather bought it as a kit in the late 1980s for his father as something to do in his later years of life. My great-grandfather was able to perform all the fine finishing work to get the clock assembled, but he was never able to get it to run properly before he passed a few years later. So for 30 years, it sat in pieces in my grandparents' attic, attracting both dust and interest from my gearhead self. It wasn't until a few years ago that I was able to finally recover the clock and have my hand at it. With no instructions at the time, I managed to get everything together and even running for a few minutes here and there. But not continuously. However, that's all about the change. Today's the day I finally resurrect the Phoenix. I received this clock from my grandmother about three years ago as just a pile of dusty parts. No instructions or manual to speak of. I knew it would look beautiful fully assembled, so I began the process of cleaning things up and putting it back together. During the cleanup, I found a maker's mark indicating it was made by Kastner Woodcraft in 1985. I spent quite a bit of time searching the internet for anything related to the company and this clock. And while I didn't find much other than two or three images, I did find a short popular mechanics article from 1985 about Kastner's wood sculpture clock from a kit. As it turns out, this kit was called the Phoenix Clock. It could be bought over mail for $450, or about $1,300 in today's money, so no small investment on my grandfather's part. The article also described a detailed 76-page instruction and assembly manual, but of course no chance I would ever lay my hands on that. I did manage to get it assembled correctly based on images from the article, and while it doesn't run, it is at least beautiful to look at. But the story doesn't end there. Fast forward two years and both my late grandparents have passed away and the family is beginning the process of cleaning up their belongings. I was clearing out a cabinet of magazines and old catalogs when I found something. The original manual for the Phoenix clock. Literally seconds from being thrown out and I found the one thing I needed to get this clock running. The real treat of it all, though, was finding literal handwritten correspondence between my great-grandfather and Jim Kastner. It seems there were some manufacturing errors on the clock, and Jim took the time to write and even hand-draw a description of the problem and some of the solutions my great-grandfather could try. I could hardly believe it. I've since spent a great deal of time adjusting the clock using the manual as a guide, but I've yet to get it to run for more than an hour or two at a time. And I think my problems lie a bit deeper than the adjustments allow. For those to make sense though, I should explain what some of these pieces are, from my novice's perspective of course. For starters, most of the showy stuff you see on the front isn't all that complicated. It's mostly gears to get the drive ratios needed for the different parts of the clock. The main shaft that runs through the center is driven by a sprocket and chain from which a weight hangs and spins the clock as it drops. The front set of gears is a reduction drive for the clock's hands and works just fine. The back of the clock, though, has a larger set of gears, and those don't work so fine. I seem to be losing power somewhere in this gear train. Either something is binding or there's too much friction in the shafts to keep the clock running. This issue becomes apparent in the next part of the clock, the escapement. This is easily the most important part of the clock, as it's literally what sets the beat. It consists of three main parts, the escape wheel, the pallet arm, and the pendulum and it acts in such a way that the pallets only allow the wheel to rotate one tooth at a time. This not only prevents the clock from spinning faster and faster as the weight drops, but also keeps the movement to an exact speed, making the clock accurate. The rate of the pallets rocking is controlled by the pendulum, which by the nature of pendulums will always rock at the same speed regardless of how large or small the pendulum swing is. And since the pendulum won't swing forever by itself, it gets a little kick from the escape wheel with every stroke. That kick, driven by the escape wheel and weight, adds back the necessary energy that the pendulum loses during normal operation, which allows the clock to keep running for more than a few seconds, or at least it's supposed to. 
the escape wheel was powered by the gear train I mentioned earlier. Under the clock zone power, you can see that the wheel ends up freezing between pallet strokes, indicating that there's something binding in the gear train. But the escapement mechanism has its own issues. The pallets will engage properly on most of the teeth of the escape wheel, but there are a couple that it appears to get hung up on each time the wheel goes around. I'm suspecting that some of the teeth are out of spec, but I won't be sure until I can investigate a little more closely. So there you have it. From what I can tell, I only have two problems. I'm losing power somewhere, and the escape wheel is out of whack. I'm pretty confident I can correct these issues though, so let's dive in. For starters, I want to solve the gear train power loss issue. It will be a lot easier to adjust the rest of the escape mechanism if I know it's actually getting the power needed to run it. Hmm, alright. Raise that count to three. Looks like this old glue joint was on its last leg. Obviously I'll have to address this as well. Let's get this the rest of the way apart. Oh man, this too? For crying out loud, the more I touch this thing, the more it falls apart. You know what? Hang on a second. This is actually one of those bushings for the escape wheel shaft. But it's also where the pendulum hangs from. I think I may have just literally stumbled upon my power loss issue. The wheel spins fine when it's just the bushing. But as soon as I hang the pendulum on it, it cocks the bushing and binds on the shaft. This may be a quicker fix than I thought. But judging by the rate all these old glue joints are failing, I'm going to go ahead and check the rest of the parts. And it's a good thing I am, because about half the gears pop free from their shafts as soon as I touch them. Including the escape wheel and gear on this one, and this bit on the pendulum crutch. I'm genuinely surprised the clock's weight didn't just plummet to the ground with how much was loose. I think the best thing to do at this point is to get everything glued back together properly before proceeding. I'll start on the base piece by first sanding and scraping away all the old glue residue. This will allow the new wood glue I'm using to actually reach the wood fibers making for a stronger joint. I'll put a light coat of glue on the mating surfaces of both parts, then join them together while aligning the features. And since these are very oddly shaped parts, I'll use some painter's tape to hold the joint together. Lastly, I'll use a damp towel to wipe away all the excess glue that's squeezed out, so I don't end up with hard globs all over the place once it dries. The rest of the joints are very similar process, except on the shaft connections. For these, I'm using a blade to score the wood prior to gluing. My thinking is this will give the wood glue more surface area and wood fibers to grab onto, making these connections stronger. I also had to get a bit creative with the different clamping setups, using different tools and scrap pieces of metal to hold the joints together while everything sets up. Now I've got almost all the pieces back together, but there is one I've not reassembled yet. Like I mentioned before, the escape wheel is one of the most important parts of the clock. Its geometry is very important to making sure the escape mechanism works as expected and the clock runs. So I want to inspect each of these teeth to make sure I don't have any problems. I don't have any prints or dimensions to go by here though, so I'm just going to have to use the sort of averaging approach. By that I mean I'll measure each tooth and address anything that seems to be way different from the rest. I'll start easy and measure the width of each tooth, which to my great surprise is very consistent. Almost all the teeth come within two thou of each other, with the exception of just one that is fifteen thou smaller. But being that it's smaller than the rest rather than bigger, I don't think that's what's causing the binding in the escapement. The next critical dimension is the distance between the teeth, since this affects the clearance of the pallets. The pallets have to clear on both the insides and the outsides of the teeth, so consistency here is also important. And once again, I'm surprised at the repeatability in the measurements. All of the spans are within three thousandths of each other, and that one smaller tooth from before? It just results in slightly more clearance on one side as I expected, which is fine. Now that takes care of what I can reasonably measure on the teeth themselves but there is a bit more to check on this wheel, like how true it's running. Just freely spinning it on the shaft, you can clearly see there's some warpage going on, and laying that on a flat surface makes that even more apparent. Being that this is wood, there isn't much I can do about this deformation, but fortunately this left-right variation isn't nearly as important as the variation in each tooth's distance from the center axis. Any significant eccentricity here changes the working distance of the escapement pallets, which could result in the clock binding up. So this is my next inspection. 
It's a bit difficult to measure with the calipers though, so I'll need to do this another way. Which happens to involve the lathe, but not in a fun chip making kind of way. At least not yet. I'll get a standard transfer punch set up here as a makeshift arbor to mount the escape wheel on, then use some shim stock to make up the difference in the diameters. Of course, making sure that the shim is engaging all the way around. This gets the wheel running dead center on its axis, as it would be in the clock. Now I can bring in the dial indicator and zero it on the first tooth, then work my way around measuring all the rest. This not only tells me the deviation from tooth to tooth, but also the deviations from the center axis. I'll also repeat these measurements two more times at two other spots along the tooth face to get a better average of what's going on here. I've got the three measurements for each of teeth 1 through 15 on the left, and then 16 through 30 are on the right. You can see the numbers bounce around from tooth to tooth, but in general they start off low in the 0 to 3 thou range, then gradually get higher and kind of peak around the 12 to 15 thou range before dropping back down. This is a huge swing in the numbers, and it points right to one of the problems I suspected. The center hole in the escape wheel is not actually on center. Finally, some real physical evidence of what might be wrong with this clock. But hold your horses, because it gets even better. I also checked the hub the wheel mounts to and found, guess what, even more run out. A pretty consistent 10 thou in this case. To top it all off, the joint between the hub and the wheel has even more free play in it. So worst case, this whole assembly may have had a full 30 thou or more of run out. That's a whole 30 second of an inch, and that is huge. No wonder I could never get this to work. But what am I going to do about it? Well, this seems like a perfect opportunity to make something. I'm thinking I can correct the eccentricities in the hub and the wheel, then make a bushing ring to fill that gap. I've been itching to make some actual chips. I'll start on the hub. Since I want the diameter to be concentric to the metal shaft it spins about, it only makes sense that I'll turn this while mounted to that shaft. But of course it's not so simple. I'll need the far end supported as well but it's already whipping around so much I can't just bring a center drill in here. Fortunately, the shaft is removable from this end, so I can mount it up individually and drill the center, then put it all back together. Simple enough. But that's not my only hurdle. The larger hub is held in place on the smaller wooden shaft by this taper pin. I'll need to turn down the whole diameter of this hub to fit the bushing I'll make later, but that won't be possible to do with this pin in the way. I guess I'm left with no choice but to make a temporary shorter one that doesn't stick out on the ends. Perfect. Let's get this on the lathe. I've never turned wood before, and a smart person would probably do some testing on a scrap piece, but only future Brandon seems to have considered this risk. Fortunately, it goes without a hitch. I've turned down the diameter just enough to clear the apparent runout where the wheel mounts. That's one variable of the equation sorted out. Now I can correct the bore on the escape wheel. My plan for this operation will require the four jaw chuck. But don't get too excited, I'm not just going to clamp this wheel right in the jaws. That would end badly for a lot of reasons. Instead, I'm going to mount this board in here to hold the wheel. And I'll cut a circular pocket that will locate the wheel on center using the perimeter teeth. Which, if you remember, is the important part. After marking the center of the board, I'll get it roughly positioned in the chuck using the tailstock center as a guide. And then drill a starting hole through the middle. Now for the messy part, to turn the pocket. Starting in the middle, I'll set up for a 50 thou cut and feed the tool across the face to form the pocket. For this first pass, I'll get something close to the final diameter that I can measure and set the DRO. Then take a few more passes making a nice deep hollow. This makes a great friction fit for the escape wheel and should in theory perfectly center the part. To hold it in place, I'll use some simple wood blocks and screw right into the board underneath. Then that's it for the setup. Time to straighten out this bore. I'll start by first clearing out the eccentricity which you can actually hear in the cuts. Mm. 
Then, after measuring from a concentric starting point, I'll take a few more passes to make room for the bushing insert I'll make next. I don't want the bushing to be too difficult to make, so I'm only opening this up just enough to give about a 40 thou wall thickness, which I think is manageable. Alright, that's variable number two eliminated. Now to tie these two together and make the bushing. While I'd like to stick with the tradition of wood on this clock, I think a smarter decision here is to use brass, but at least it's a fancy metal in its own right. I don't need much, so this scrap piece from an old project will do perfectly. I'll start by first drilling out the bore one size below my final dimension, then finish it out with the boring bar to match the hub diameter. It needs to be a very close fit on both the ID and OD to provide the centering I'm looking for. But since this fit is so close, it doesn't leave much room for the glue. Nor does the smooth surface of the brass help with adhesion. So I need to give it some texture. Nothing too scientific though, just a quickly fed 10 thou pass with the boring cutter to make a sort of spiral groove. This should hopefully give the glue something to hold on to. The outside is a similar process of whittling down the diameter until it's a perfect fit for the wheel bore. Then again adding a spiral texture to the outside before parting it off. A brief cleanup on the opposite end, and then the bushing is finished. It's a perfect fit on both the hub and the wheel, and even though it's a fix, it actually looks like an intentional decorative feature. All that's left to do now is to glue it all together. Even though this is brass, I'm still using wood glue in hopes that the texture I added will give the glue something to grab onto. And if it doesn't, I should have no problem getting these apart to try something else. I'll also go ahead and reattach the drive gear as well. And then clean up all the excess glue with a damp towel. Once everything is dry, this just leaves one final thing to address. The hub's color. I turned away the original finish, so I want to get this back to matching the rest of the clock. The instruction manual actually has an extensive section on wood dyes and stains. As it turns out, this wood is maple, which has a closed pore structure, making the pigment particle used in stains less effective. Instead, all of these pieces were originally treated with an alcohol-soluble dye that actually changes the color of the wood fibers and not just fills the pores. But in a classic Brandon move, I didn't think to look into this until now. And it's not something you can just pick up at your local hardware store. So I'm going to see if I can get some of the pigment stains I had laying around to work. This area is pretty small, so I'm hoping I can get close with something I have. I'll play it smart though and do some testing on a scrap piece of maple first. Of the three colors, this reddish one looks the closest, but still needs a little work. Another coat of the red gets it a little closer. Then a light coat of the medium dark brings the brightness down just a bit. It's not exactly the same, but I think that will work. Besides, there's already a wide variety of tones across the rest of the clock parts, so a little difference on this part should blend right in. With the formula sorted out, I'll use the same application procedure on the hub. And despite this being a stain as opposed to a dye that was originally used, this gets it pretty darn close. The last thing I'll add is a couple coats of tongue oil. This will give a protective coating and a similar sheen to the rest of the parts. Then that's the repair complete. I'm pretty optimistic this eccentricity correction will solve a lot of the problems I was having with this clock. Remeasuring the runout in the teeth now, I'm consistently falling within an 8 thou window. This is a huge improvement over the 15 thou I measured earlier, which was likely closer to 30 thou after considering the hub eccentricity and the shaft gap I showed earlier. I'm pretty pleased with this result. Of course, there is just one last thing I'd like to do before assembling this. And that's to get everything cleaned of all the dust and grime that's built up over the years. After a while, I've got everything prettied up and I'm ready for final assembly. Even though I think I fixed the biggest problem, I'm still going to have to make some adjustments in a few places once I get this together. One of those adjustments is in the pallets. These are held in place with screws and can be moved in and out to get them perfectly matched to the escape wheel teeth. There's actually a lot of nuance to this interaction that's thankfully explained in great detail in the instruction manual. In addition to the pallets, there's also a more subtle adjustment that can be made at this bushing, the bore of which is actually eccentric to the outside diameter. So as I turn this, the pallet arm moves closer to the escape wheel axis and changes the interaction.
The next adjustment is on this part called the crutch, which links the pallet arm to the pendulum. Here I can move this pin left or right to affect how the pallets engage with the escape wheel. All of which will make more sense once this thing is running, so let's get it on the wall. And I'll hang this backwards for now so I can actually see what's going on. I'll get the weights supported from the drive chain, then install the pendulum and give it a push. All right, that's a great sign. It's running on its own, which means I must already be close. I think it still needs a little work though. If you listen closely, the beats aren't spaced out evenly. They aren't actually one second and one second apart, but probably more like 0.8 seconds and 1.2 seconds. You can see this on the pendulum as well. The beat occurs around 60% of the swing to the right, then exactly at the peak of the swing to the left. Furthermore, the left pallet is barely engaging with the escape wheel teeth. It needs to be swinging up into the golly a bit once it catches that tooth. It's hard to see, but the right pallet is shooting way up into the golly on this side. So it looks like I need to make a small adjustment to the crutch. This will in effect rotate the pallet arm clockwise a bit, shifting those engagement points and evening out the timing. That's a little better. The left pallet is swinging up into the tooth more, but there's still a little bit of imbalance in the pendulum beat. One more turn should do it. I think I got it that time. The left and right pallets appear to be engaging evenly on the escape wheel, and the ticks seem a lot more synchronized to the pendulum beat, engaging at about the 80% mark on both left and right swings. And despite what you might be thinking, this extra 20% swing on each side is actually a good thing. If you remember, torque is supplied to the escape wheel by the clock weights and the sliding of the wheel teeth on the pallets is what gives the pendulum a little kick with each stroke. So this extra 20% swing is basically a safety margin that keeps this clock running. This is especially important for a clock made from wood. I've been skirting around this point for this whole project, but wood isn't the best choice of material to make a clock from. Changes in temperature and especially humidity cause wood fibers to expand and contract, essentially changing the dimensions of the components. Too much change and the clock would just stop working. That's likely why all these adjustments were included on the clock's design in the first place. And that excess power provided by the clock's weights actually helps push through those times when the clock's geometry drifts away from ideal but is still functional. Seems old Jim Kastner knew a thing or two about wood clocks. While this runs now, the real test will be if it stays running. So I'll get the hands and face remounted, set them for the current time, and then we wait. My current record is no more than a couple hours, so this test will take a bit. But so far this thing hasn't stopped of its own accord once since I first nudged the pendulum 45 minutes ago. Regardless, my fingers are still crossed it will survive the night. Coming into the shop to the thumps of a ticking clock never sounded so sweet. We've officially been running strong for 15 hours straight, and it's only picked up about two minutes in that time. This brings me to the last adjustment on this clock, the pendulum. A pendulum's length directly correlates to how long it takes to swing. And on this clock, I can change the pendulum's length with this nut on the bottom. So I'll back this nut out a couple turns to lengthen the pendulum and make it swing ever so slightly slower. Of course, this will take some trial and error to home in on over a period of days, but you have my word, I'll get it dialed in just right. With that, I think I'm safe to finally call this project complete. And man, has it been a long time coming. For three years, I've been trying to get this clock to work. And for 30 years before that, it was left abandoned in pieces in an attic. And if the legend is true, it never properly ran to begin with. Words can't really describe the feeling of finally completing the project my great-grandfather started all those years ago. And it's a real treat to be able to leave my own subtle mark on this heirloom piece. I'm looking forward to enjoying its timekeeping for years to come, as I hope my future generations do as well. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time.